Hey everyone, welcome to Northwoods. My name is Jason and I'm here with Janine this weekend and we are about ready to get ready for today's services and we are so excited that you've chosen to join us either online or on campus and uh, we're ready for a great service. And one of the things that uh, we want people to do as we're getting ready to start the service is to uh, say hello in the chat. If you're attending in your living room or in your car or wherever you are uh, on Northwoods online or on Facebook Live, make sure you say hello in the chat and just let us know where you're tuning in from. We've got some great hosts who are ready to to help you throughout the entire service. And a great way to do that is just to connect with them as we get started. Well, you know what? If you are new here, we want to know that you're here with us today. So you can do that. If you're online, go to the little button that says connection card and fill that card out. It lets us know that you're joining us today. It's a place where you can leave a prayer request or you can even leave a comment and let us know what's going on in your life or just if you're having an awesome day today. And then if you're on campus, we still want you to fill out that connection card and you can do that on your mobile app. There's a little button there that says connection card, fill it out and let us know you're here. And then if you're on campus, we'd also love for you to join one of our new here kiosks. You can find them around the church and we have some incredible volunteers who are there who can show you around, tell you about what's going on and answer any questions that you have. So check out one of our new here kiosks. Yeah, absolutely. The connection card, like Janine mentioned, is this a great tool for us as the church family to care for one another, for our church staff to care for you and for you to be connecting with our church staff. And we're just in a, a difficult season of ministry. And so as people are distributed at their homes, on their couches, or across our campuses, we want to make sure that we're caring for everybody well. And the connection card is a way, great way to do that in the mobile app, which is a great tool for people to use. You can take notes uh, as you're listening to today's message in the service right there in the mobile app. There's a lot of great things and resources resources there in the mobile app for you to check out. So make sure you check those out today. But it's time for us to get started. And we've got a great morning of worship planned and great teaching. So Northwoods starts right now.
We need your presence. In your presence there is peace. In your presence we are free. There's no better place to be. There's no better place to be. In your presence there is truth. In your presence mountains move. We forever run to you. We forever run to you. In your presence there is peace. In your
Christ is alive. Give him praise one more time. Thank you, Jesus. I was reminded this morning of a passage in Romans. It says, may the God of all hope fill you with joy and peace. Is there anyone here today who needs a little more joy and some peace today? May the God of all hope fill you with joy and peace as you trust in him. Just take a moment here and just encourage you to place all of your trust in Jesus Christ this morning. Encourage you to trust whatever it is for you. Maybe just encourage you to say, God, I trust you with my future. Whatever that is for you, just let him know right now. God, I trust you with my finances. God, I trust you with my family. Trust you with my health, with my job. Whatever that is, just release your faith again. That's that's what faith is. It's trust in him. Jesus, we trust you. We know that passage says that we will overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would bring about peace, bring about fresh joy in our lives today, that you would help us to be those who overflow with hope. Thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for that praise you for who you are in this place. Fill us with fresh joy, fresh peace. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen, amen. Give the Lord a shout of praise just one more time. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. You can go ahead and grab a seat. Welcome to Northwood. So great to have you with us, whether you're tuning in online or at one of our campuses. Always great to be together. My name's John. If we haven't met, great to have you here with us this weekend. We know in 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul said that God loves a cheerful giver. And so when it comes to giving, I know that sometimes I've heard people say, I don't feel too cheerful about giving my resources back to God. But can I encourage you and just promise you that when you, when we give as an act of obedience to God, while we might not always feel like it in the moment, there is always joy that follows on the backside when we are being obedient to God. Because there's always joy that follows obedience. And so I just want to encourage you to, to, again, be obedient in your giving back to God. That's an investment that will always have a return in the form of changed lives in the kingdom of God. So thank you again for continuing to be faithful in your giving, church. And as always, during this season, we have not been passing the bags, 
but you can give a variety of different ways. We have boxes at the back of the auditorium that you can slip cash or check into. You can give online at northwoods.church slash give, or you can text to give 309-243-1550. And then as always, you can always just drop a check uh, in the mail and you can just mail it. So thank you again for your faithful giving. Well, this coming Friday and Saturday is our Freedom Weekend here at Northwoods. It's really kind of our capstone experience for those who have been working their way through our Get Free class. And I know that many of you have been going through that right now. Many of you have been joining us on campus for our Get Free class. And there's many of you that have been joining us online for Get Free each week. So if you've been doing that, do not miss this Friday and Saturday for our Freedom Uh, weekend. It's an experience where we just invite the Holy Spirit to heal any wounds, hurts in our lives and bring his power to uh, to help us break free from sin that maybe have us stuck in our life. You know, we always have to say that Jesus came to not only forgive us from the penalty of our sin, but he came to set us free from the power of our sin. So Freedom Weekend is this coming Friday and Saturday. And hey, if you're here and you've never been through our Get Free Courses, We'd encourage you to do that, but that doesn't mean that you can't come to the Freedom Weekend. So if you've never been, we'd encourage you to check it out. You can find more information about that at northwoods.church slash freedom. Well, every year around this time, generally, we are talking about our upcoming Christmas production at Northwoods. I mean, that's, that's what we're known for in the community is our Christmas production. We have an amazing team that pulls off an incredible pr- Christmas production every year. But this year, as we were beginning to plan, because we have to plan way in advance of this thing, we just started having questions about, you know, are we really going to, is it wise for us to pack 3,000 people into 10 different shows? Would, would people even show up in great numbers for that? And so we had to make a little bit of a pivot. And so this year, we will not be doing an in-person Christmas production, but we have two other opportunities that I'm believing God is going to use to reach many people for Jesus Christ this Christmas season. One of those is we are going to be airing last year's Christmas production on December 19th at 8 p.m. on uh, a local TV station, WEEK, that's NBC channel around here. And then we'll also be partnering with WCIC, a local radio station, that's 91.5. We'll be doing a Christmas carol sing-along with our team. So again, not the same this year, but I'm praying, and I hope you'll pray with us, that God will use both of those things digitally to reach many people for Jesus Christ. So I'd encourage you, gather your friends, gather your, maybe it's your family, your small group, whatever it looks like, and huddle around the TV or the radio, just like old times, and tune in with us on December 19th at 8 p.m., and then through the local radio, radio station at 91.5. Now, these are both very new developments, and so there will be new details coming about those shortly. Now, today, our senior pastor is going to be continuing in our uh, Beatitudes series that we've been in. But before he comes up, go ahead and check out the screen for a little bit of sights and some of the sights and sounds of the Holy Land. to set you free now so you're walking with a heart that's no longer broken and so that you're not in chain to sin anymore he read that here he preached that here sat down and said this is fulfilled for you all right northwoods how you doing today everybody good you sounded good hey welcome to those of you our online family and our other campuses and just to highlight this little update with Israel. We are um, at least making plans for when it opens up. So um, we have a June trip uh, that we're planning. We have November planned. But again, if you're somebody who's wanted to go, um, you're not making a commitment to that by just showing up afterwards. uh, Go down to classroom G, and we're just going to kind of take you through a little bit about what a Northwoods trip is all about. 
and uh, you can learn any details there that you need to learn. Would love to have you go along, uh, particularly if we are able to go again this year. And those of you watching online as well, uh, you can go to northwoods.churchholyland. Uh, you, you can send an email in and let us know, and we'll get you whatever if information you might want to know as well. Now, years ago when my kids were young, I heard a story from a very well-known pastor of a large church that gave me a little hope, really encouraged me in my own parenting since my kids were young at the time. This pastor's three-year-old son, Matt, had had his good friend Luke over to play that afternoon, and Matt had just had a very bad day. Um, He'd been grumpy, he'd been mean, wouldn't share his toys, got into fights, and so when Luke had gone home and Matt was being put down for his afternoon nap, his mother said to him, you know, Matt, Luke is... Luke is one of your best friends. You really should be a little nicer to him. And this little three-year-old responded without batting an eye, and I quote, well, sometimes I'm mean, sometimes I'm not, like father, like son. (laughs) That's not bad for a three-year-old, is it? Uh, Parents, don't you just love it when those sorts of things start showing up in your kids? Catherine, my oldest, was only two years old when she said, let out a little burp at the table one day. And when Susan said, Catherine, we don't do that, say, excuse me, Catherine responded, Daddy, do that. <laughs> and I was like, wait a minute. Don't you dare to go blaming your burps on me, right? It's got to be one of the most humbling experiences of parenting when in that moment of correcting your child for whatever it was, you feel like you're looking in the mirror. You just don't want to tell them that, Right? I remember when Catherine, then 13 years old, came home from summer camp, so proud of the fact that she had set the camp record for eating the most pancakes at breakfast one morning. (laughs) What could I say when I was the same age at the same camp, Miracle Camp? I consumed 22 slices of French toast one morning for breakfast, and I was really proud of it. My wife used to just shake her head and say, what can I say? She's her father's daughter. (laughs) Susan got credit for all the good stuff, you know. Now, some of those traits in our kids may be humorous and humbling, but you know it works the other way around as well. You know, when Kate came home one day and said, you know, Dad, some of my friends were making fun of a girl today and made her cry, and because I was friends with that girl and didn't like how they were treating her, they started saying bad things about me, too, but I didn't care because I knew they weren't doing the right thing. See, when any of my kids demonstrated courageous honesty, integrity, or leadership in a particular situation, there was that sense of deep pleasure and parental pride which caused us to say, yep, that's my girl, yep. That's my boy, right? Every parent knows that there's hardly a greater sense of satisfaction in this life than when our children exemplify the very spiritual and moral values we've sought to instill in them and when they do that in the midst of a conflict where it would have been easier just to not do it. Yeah, that's my kid. I want to tap into that familiar sense of parental pride to help you understand today that there is a moment When Father God feels that same sense of satisfaction and pride in his own sons and daughters and says, yep, that's my child. In fact, Jesus said, there's one particular quality that brings about that distinction. And that quality is singled out in the seventh beatitude to a blessed life when Jesus said in Matthew 5 and verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called, what? Children of God. What Jesus was saying is that this quality, peacemaking, will not only lead to a blessed life, but actually distinguishes us marks us out, sets us apart as sons and daughters of the living God. And why should it? See, God is a peace-seeking and a peacemaking God. His name is Jehovah Shalom, the God of peace. His son came into this world as the prince of peace. The gospel he preached 
was the gospel of peace. That is that we could know peace with God through the forgiveness of our sins and the peace of God within resulting in a desire for peace with others. As his followers, we've been given actually a ministry and a message of peace. The Bible calls it a ministry, a message of reconciliation, which is nothing less than inviting others to experience peace with God. God's heart and God's desire for each of us, no matter our circumstances today, is found in 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 16. It's a prayer, and when it's a prayer, you can pray this prayer for yourself. Look at God's heart for you. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every Way. Anybody needing peace today? Here's God's heart for you. Amen? Come on, we receive it from the Lord today. His heart for us is peace. And so as you display his peace and become an agent of peace in this world, it distinguishes you as a child of God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. So the question is, what does it take to become a true peacemaker as defined by Jesus. And it's an important question primarily because of some misconceptions that surround this whole idea of peacemaking even in the church today. In other words, many in the church today confuse peacemaking with what I call peace faking. But notice Jesus didn't say blessed are the peace fakers. He didn't say you would be fulfilled and blessed by pretending to be at peace with others when in reality you are anything but, right? You walk into church and you see that person that you're ticked at, but you don't want them to know, so you smile and say, oh, how are you doing today? And as you walk away, you go, good Lord, I can hardly, hardly stand. <laughs> we all do it. We played that game before. That's called peace faking. Jesus didn't say you'd be fulfilled or blessed if you got real good at hiding your true feelings or if you could fake it till you make it. He didn't say you'd be fulfilled and blessed if you just learned to stuff your bitterness and anger every time someone hurt or offended you. I used to have a coffee mug. I have no idea where it got to. It was my favorite. It used to sit in my office somewhere. It was a cow. He's dead. He's on his back, legs straight up. Rigor mortis has set in, and underneath it says, really, I'm fine. That's a peace faking cup right there. Peace fakers are people who either because of their deep seated fear of confrontation or their deep seated insecurities or their deeply ingrained patterns of people pleasing would rather stuff their feelings of ill will towards others and pretend that all is well even when it is not. And might I just add that this often seems to be the preferred approach for many believers when dealing with conflict with others in the church. And I get why this is. It's easy to go here. It's easy to call it peacemaking. I mean, we know that it certainly wouldn't be right for us to scream and yell and cuss and make a scene when we're upset with someone else. That's certainly not Jesus' way. And at the same time, we tell ourselves that we're truly spiritual and if we really love others, we will avoid conflict with another person at all costs because conflict doesn't feel loving or spiritual. So we do our best to pretend all is well. And yet, we have to do something with the feelings of distrust, bitterness, anger, and hurt we haven't been honest about. That stuff doesn't go away just because we try to pretend it's not there. So what do we do? Well, we conveniently opt for one of several common approaches and wrongly assume that we're peacemaking when in actuality we're peace faking. For instance, some peace fakers become extremely adept at avoidance. That is, they either avoid the person or they avoid the issue Or both, assuming that if they can ignore the problem long enough, it'll either go away or they'll eventually adapt and learn to live with it. But you and I both know that ignoring a real problem never causes it to get better over time. Rather, it's the surest way to make the problem worse because we're just seething with inward turmoil. Other peace fakers resort to appeasement. So there's avoidance, there's appeasement. That is, they assume that true peacemaking means that they must always give in and let the other person have his or her own way just to kind of make them happy. 
Somewhere along the way, they learned to equate peacemaking with passivity. The Apostle Paul said in Romans 12, 18, and I love this verse, if it is possible, look at this, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everybody. But appeasers generally read that this way. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, try to get everyone else to live at peace with you. Make sure they're at peace with you. I don't control whether somebody's at peace with me. I only control my side of the street. But appeasers regularly assume responsibility for everyone else's peace and happiness. I'm familiar with this one because for years I lived as a top-notch appeaser and people pleaser. I, I regularly took responsibility for how someone might feel about me if I did or didn't do what I thought they wanted me to do. And if you're an appeaser and haven't discovered this yet, I want to let you in on a little secret today. You will not discover happiness or fulfillment in life by assuming responsibility for everyone else's happiness. That's the surest road to misery. It was a liberating day in my life when I realized that God had not made me responsible for anybody else's happiness. I'm to love them, respect them, honor them, treat them well, all that type of stuff. But I don't make them happy. They decide to be happy or not. I was the kid who, because I thought I had to keep everybody else happy, if someone had come up to me and asked for my lunch money and said, you're being selfish if you don't give it to me and I'm going to be mad at you, I would have thought, well, Jesus doesn't want me to be selfish and I don't want him mad at me. Since I'm supposed to share and make others happy, I should give him my lunch money. See, it gets confusing because it feels there's a little bit biblical in there, but there's something else going on. I was like that in college. I would let other people borrow my car whenever they wanted. They'd run my gas out of it and not bother to fill it up, which would really tick me off. But in the interest of peacemaking, I'd say nothing. Several times I had to fix flat tires and other problems stemming from someone's irresponsible use of my car. But do you think I ever said anything about it? No, nah, I, was, I was doing what Jesus told me to do, or so I thought. I was, I was being a peacemaker. And I can guarantee you that while I was fixing that car, I was feeling and thinking anything but peaceful thoughts towards the offenders. I won't tell you what I was thinking. But guess what? Next time one of the culprits would ask to use my car, while my internal dialogue would be, I can't believe you have the gall to ask me again. You don't deserve to ever set foot in my car again. But spiritual guy that I was, I'd smile, hand him the keys, and say, anytime. Peacemakers, you, you know what I'm talking about. And you know what we discover sooner or later? It doesn't matter how good we get at faking it. There's no peace to be had living that way. Because all the time we're faking it, we're actually building up incredible inner reserves of resentment and hostility towards the very people we're pretending to be at peace with. In the end, peace fakers end up with distant relationships, no real happiness, and a boatload of emotional pain. Those are the peace fakers. But then we're probably all familiar with the second type of person, and that is the peace taker. So there's peacemakers, there's peace fakers, and there's peace takers. Now, again, uh, we, we're probably, once, once you start walking with Jesus, it's probably easier to fall into more of the peace faking, but there, we, we, we've all been around people who are into peace taking. This one I don't go as much detail into because we just know we're not supposed to be this way. These are people who basically make life miserable for everyone else because they insist that life be lived on their terms. And if you don't like it, well, tough. And thus, through brute force of personality and considerable ego, they basically establish their own rules and ask everyone else to adapt. These are the CEOs, parents, coaches, teachers, etc., who operate in what I call seagull mode. That is, they fly in, they make a whole lot of noise, they dump all over everybody, and then they fly out just sapping the environment at whatever peace there may have been before their grand entrance. This is the bully on the playground who says, either let me play and go by my rules, or I'm taking the ball and none of you will play. And I might add, peace takers love doing business with peace fakers. Because the peace faker reasons, well, we're going to need a ball, so we had better let him play, even though I hate his guts, right? Peace takers make their living by insensitivity. I don't really care what anyone else thinks. Intimidation, do it or else. And manipulation, if you don't do it my way, I'm gonna make life miserable for you. Now here's the truth about these two groups. You're not gonna be blessed and fulfilled if you go through life as either a peace faker or a peace taker. 
if you're a peace taker, you're simply not going to have many friends. Of course, you'll try to tell yourself that you don't care. But after a while, maybe in the silence of your lonely life, it might dawn on you. You know, if you have a problem with your wife, and you had a problem with the one before her, and the one before her, and the one before her, and you have a problem with your kids, you have a problem with your parents, you have a problem with your boss, you have a problem with your coworkers, etc. maybe, just maybe, you're the problem. Peace takers can change when they come to that point. If you're a peace taker, you simply won't have too many friends. On the other hand, if you're a peace faker, you'll probably be popular with a lot of people, but close to very few. See, because your failure to deal appropriately and honestly with your emotional pain will cause you to keep it at arm's length. Or every time there's a conflict and somebody hurt you and they don't even know it, you're avoiding and you're, you, uh uh-uh. Again, Jesus didn't say blessed are the peace fakers and peace takers. Rather, he said blessed are the peace makers. By this, he was highlighting the fact that peace with others is something you and I have to intentionally pursue. Notice he didn't say, blessed are the peace lovers, or blessed are the peace wanters. See, a lot of people may desire peace, they may like the idea of peace, and yet be unwilling to lift a hand to do anything about it. No, to become a peacemaker, we have to work for it, we have to pray for it, we have to sweat over it. Yes, sometimes even weep over it. Sometimes it may even demand that we live with an open wound of conflict or misunderstanding for the time being in order not to settle for a fake or a false peace. So becoming a peacemaker is not necessarily the easiest thing in the world. But it is the way to true fulfillment, and it sure beats being a peace faker or a peace taker. So let's look, as I wrap up with the rest of our time here, five key factors to becoming peacemakers. How do I become a peacemaker? Factor number one starts here for every one of us. Start with your heart. Start with your heart. If, you, if you're going to be a peacemaker, you first have to be a peace partaker. When it comes to peace, our motto needs to be, it takes some to make some. You have to be a person of peace yourself. You cannot be God's agent of reconciliation with others until you have first been reconciled to God yourself. Now, some of you are watching online, maybe at our other campuses, maybe in here at our campus today. Listen, if you don't know Jesus Christ, here's what I'm going to say. You are like an unfinished puzzle because you are missing an important Peace, P-E-A-C-E. And until you get that peace, you're going to be fighting with yourself, your spouse, your kids, your parents, your teachers, your coach, your God. And the point is you cannot help other people discover their missing peace until you have discovered your own missing peace. It takes some to make some. And if there's one thing we have been learning in this series, the kind of life Jesus invites us to is the kind of life he alone can give. We cannot get this kind of life by trying to arrange our external circumstances. We must invite Jesus Christ to change our internal condition by putting our faith and trust in him. The Bible says that when we put our faith in Jesus, we are, here's a, it's a great word in the Bible, it's one of the big words of the Bible, we are justified at that point. And it's a legal term which means we are declared righteous with God. Our sin is removed. It means not guilty. And then look at this, Romans chapter 5 and and verse 1 says, Therefore, since we have been justified, declared not guilty, made righteous with God, justified how? By faith. Look what happens. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Once we have peace with God, listen, now we're ready to become peacemakers for God. See, so it starts with your heart and knowing that you have peace with God. And that, guys, that speaks to our objective position because it's, it's like, you, you know, you may not, at the moment you put your faith in Jesus, you may not have felt something major changed, but your status with God changed by faith in Jesus. It's what we call your position with God. Not guilty, righteous before God, justified by faith. 
So that's what we call your legal position. But then the Bible speaks about another peace, the peace of God, which now becomes your subjective condition. All right? So you got a legal position and a subjective condition. And this leads to factor number two. You start with your heart. Factor number two, I want to say it this way. Be sure you're secure. It's going to be some of the most important thing I tell you today right here. God's will for you is to know both peace with God, not guilty, declared righteous because you put your faith in Jesus. He wants you to have peace with God and the peace of God on the inside. I didn't put the verses here, but you might want to write them down. Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. It says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Now, that's what you've got to be doing when you're working through conflict and everything else. I'm taking my anxiety. I'm taking my, I want to avoid. I want to, I want to run. No, no, no. I'm taking my anxiety to God with prayer and thanksgiving. I'm going to present my request. Lord, would you help me to be a peacemaker in this? Would you help? And then look, look at what it says, verse 7. If you're doing that, the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will keep your mind and heart at rest in him. Isn't that amazing? It's the peace of God. So you got to be sure you're secure, that you're walking in the peace of God. Guys, it's the peace of God operating your soul that will heal your insecurities and make you secure in God's love, leading to a deep sense of peace within yourself. And one of the marks that this healing has taken place in you is that you become much less easily offended by the slights of others. Stay with me. That's why I named this, I entitled this one, you know, the Be Attitude Blessed Life, Be Unoffendable. Your identity in Christ and your sense of his love for you is not to be determined by who's mad at you or upset with you. And to the degree that it is that you are thrown off because someone is upset, that's a sign that your security is not coming from Jesus and that you're not walking in the peace of God. And if, in fact, you have been at fault in causing some of that unrest, you can easily, if you're walking in the peace of God, you know his love for you, you can seek to address it without feeling all beat up and beat down within yourself because you know the peace of Christ. One of the greatest needs of a true peacemaker is to know the deep inner security of Christ's love, joy, and peace. Peacemaking takes that kind of personal security. And if you lack that kind of inner security, then I'm telling you, you need to seek God for freedom and healing. Get to our Friday and Saturday Freedom Conference. Because you will have no greater peace on the outside. Nothing extra is going to happen out there until it starts working on the inside. You've got to be able to confront when necessary. You've got to take the brunt of other people's anger and name calling and yet keep on loving in the process. Look at Proverbs 12, verse 16. It says, a prudent person overlooks an insult. And see, the only way we can do that is by becoming more secure and in that security, more undefendable. So let me ask you this question today. Be honest. How unoffendable are you? Now, this next sentence is going to be maybe the most important one I give you today. When I ask you how unoffendable are you, listen that's the measure of your security in Christ. That's the measure of how much more healing you might need. If you say, well, I'm, I'm always getting offended. That's the measure of how much more healing you need. The truth is people can't hurt you without your permission. They can offend you without your permission. And the more you draw your security from what God says about you, the more you will find yourself able to overlook other people's insults and handle other people's unhappiness with you when you know you must confront a situation in which you are just saying, I'm no longer going to live as a peacemaker. Start with your heart. Be sure you're secure. Here's factor number three. Don't wait to initiate. Don't wait to initiate. And by this, I'm not talking about the necessary and prudent waiting that may have to ensure uh, or ensue until the emotions of the moment have calmed down. Nothing gets solved in the anger of the moment. 
You do know that, don't you? What I'm getting at is our need to settle matters quickly. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 25, I just want you to have these first couple of words, settle matters quickly. And in that context, he was saying with your adversary who's taking you to court, what he's talking about there, settle matters quickly when you know you're having a dispute with somebody else. Because the longer you allow it to go, the worse it's going to get. It's essentially what he said. God's word says in Ephesians 4, 26, in your anger, do not sin. Do you know that you can be angry and not be sinning? But you don't want to live with that anger. In your anger, do not sin. Look at this, do not let the sun go down. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. You understand what I'm saying when I say don't wait to initiate? Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. I think about it, I, I, I share this with a lot of the weddings I do about a couple that had been married 40 years and they had this amazing marriage, or so it seemed, and they were talking to them kind of, you know, at the little banquet, share with us a little bit about some of the secrets of your happy marriage or whatever. And, and the wife said, well, uh, part of it is due to the fact that on the day we were married, we made a covenant with one another that we would never go to bed while we were mad at each other. And then she said... Now, we haven't slept for three days. (laughs) Kind of misses the point. Don't wait to initiate. Jesus was saying, don't sit around excusing yourself for the next five years in a situation of relational conflict by saying things like, well, I'm just not good at confronting. I don't like to confront. I don't handle conflict very well. It's just going to make things worse. Well, we become prophetic, don't we? It's going to make things worse, and we opt out of even doing what Jesus is telling us to do. Some some of us even get real spiritual about about it. We've been we've been peace faking in a relationship for ten years, and we say, "Well, I'm praying for God to show me the right time." No, you aren't. (laughs) Jesus said, "Don't wait to initiate." The right time is any time there's a conflict to be resolved, and the sooner the better. Not 10 years, because he hasn't told me yet. Which means that some of you need to plan a peace conference this afternoon. Some of you need to sit down with a spouse and start moving towards peacemaking. And yes, Sometimes things may have to get worse before they get better. That's okay. Some of you might need to pick up the phone and call a parent. Some parent might need to pick up the phone and call a grown child. It might be a talk with a boss tomorrow. Plan a conference and don't wait to initiate. Jesus said, if you know that you have something against someone else or you know that they have something against you, you need to call for a peace conference. He said, first, go to that person in private. First thing. If you work things out, great. But if you don't, then take someone else along with you and seek to work it out. But Jesus said, whether you're the offender or the offended, the initiative needs to be yours to get together with that person and seek to bring resolution to the issue and possibly reconciliation to the relationship. And I say possibly because I don't control whether the other person wants to be at peace with me. I can only control Romans 12, 18 on my side, right? As much as it lies within me, I'm going to try to be at peace with everybody. That doesn't mean they're going to be at peace with me. But I'm okay. See, because I'm secure in Jesus. So if they don't want that peace with me, okay. Don't wait to initiate. And then just by way of a few peacemaking pointers, factor number four has to do with the actual moment of peacemaking or when you have your peace conference. Now, guys, I could write a whole series of sermons on just these next couple of minutes that I'm going to share with you. Can't do it all here today, so I'm going to just give you some real quick pointers for what you're to do when you come to that peace conference. Hopefully, it'll, it'll lead to peace. Okay? First, I, the factor number four, I call that sit back, don't attack. Okay? You, you don't make peace by attacking the other person. So what does it mean to kind of assume a sit back or a step back position. Number one, affirm the relationship. Listen, if you, if you're getting together with somebody that you're in conflict with, the best thing you can do is say, you know what? I love you. I love the relationship that we've had. I sense distance between us. I feel like it'd just be great if we could sit down and talk, talk through whatever it is that has brought distance to our relationship. See, you're affirm, 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 affirm. You're just dialing everything down now and you're making that person feel like, well, that's great. I'm, I'm glad that I'm still loved and I'm glad, you know, let's work towards it. 
from the relationship. If you can't do that, you're probably not ready for a peace conference. Two, make observations rather than accusations. You're in the, that's a step back. I'm not gonna attack, right? So when I say make observations rather than accusations, again, I could do a whole message on this. What I am saying is speak only for yourself. Learn how to say, when this happened, I felt. Not, you made me feel this way. That's attack. No, own your own feelings. When this happened, I felt this way. Number three, control the volume. How many of you know Proverbs 15, 1 says, a soft answer turns away wrath, but harsh words stir up anger. If the emotions rise, call a timeout and just say, hey, maybe, maybe we need to meet at another time. You may have to get together more than once. You know, you're not gonna make, maybe make it all in one big step. But how many of you know when the emotions start to rise, the ears shut off, right? Probably not gonna have peace in that context. So the sit back position is, I wanna be in a place of security, I wanna be in a place of rest, and I wanna be in a place where my emotions are in check, and I'm at peace within. I'm not gonna allow this thing. So you just know, if the, if the volume's going up, the likelihood of peace is going down. So we better call a timeout. Number four, attack the problem, not the person. Attack the problem, not the person. Again, could do a whole message. But here, I'll just, uh, uh, one quick pointer. Keep never and always out of it. You know, you know when you're in an argument with somebody and go, you never do, right? Or you always do that, right? And what's the response? Oh, I'm sure I never, or I'm sure I always, right? And it's, it's listen, never is never true, and always is always wrong. Because there's nobody that never does and always does, right? And what it does, when you use those kind of, that kind of language, you're now attacking the person rather than the problem. So keep never and always out of it. Number five, seek agreement but not appeasement. This just means how, how can we find a win-win here? I'm not just trying to go, okay, I'm sorry, I'll never do that again. And the whole time they're putting it on you rather than saying, wait, wait that doesn't feel like a win to me. Let's, let's, I, I, I want to respect where you're coming from. I want you to respect where I'm coming from. Let's, let's look for something that, that works for both of us. All right? Six, close the time by affirming the relationship. And understand, depending on the depth of the conflict, how long it's been there, you may have to get together for a number of times. There was a time back in the early days in Northwoods where for whatever reason, I was at odds with the elders and we got together to work through some of the misunderstanding with the elders of our denomination. And I remember as we sat around, going around the circle that day, uh, and they asked, well, how do you guys feel about what happened here today? Man, my heart was just taken out by the time we were done. It's like people would go, well, I don't feel like we got anywhere. I don't feel like it was really worth anything. It doesn't feel like we resolved anything. And when it came to me, I said, you know what, guys? I appreciate the fact that what we did today was we took a step into the tunnel of chaos. Sometimes, you know what, when you've been faking the peace, it feels like chaos when you decide, I'm not gonna fake it anymore. Kaboom. And you take a step into the tunnel of chaos where you're laying the feelings on the table and, you're working, and you maybe don't get it all worked through. I said, guys, we took a step into the tunnel and you can't get through the tunnel in one great big step. So I'm excited that we finally decided rather than faking it to take a step into the tunnel and let's get together and keep taking some more steps because I think we're going to get to the other side. That's how you get from the prison to the palace. It's got to go through the tunnel, tunnel of chaos. That just means that you may not be all the way through and so what you want to do is thank you so much for meeting today and I know maybe we don't feel like we've got it all resolved yet but I want you to know I love you and I'm, I'm committed to staying in that tunnel until we get to the other side. That's what I'm talking about here. And then number seven, maybe some of you will need this. Whenever necessary, use a counselor or some other qualified person as a third party mediator. Listen, there are reasons why whole ministries have grown up today around this issue of peacemaking. Why? Because we need help. And there are people that can help us move through that tunnel of chaos 
who know how to do it, can referee while we're in the middle of that tunnel, and can help us get there. So don't just, listen, if you're not getting there by yourself, that probably is an indication, is there somebody else that can help us do this? All right? Like I say, that's about seven messages. But I wanted to give you a few things because it may start to percolate in your heart. Here's number five, factor number five. When it's a mess, choose to bless. When it's a mess, choose to bless. This is as incredibly powerful as it is incredibly rare. The Bible says in Romans 12, 14, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. One of the ways you know you're living at peace is you're not out there just blasting somebody else all the time. Saying, well, you know, I'm really at peace with them. No, you're not at peace with them. Not when you're out just talking about them, blasting them for what they, no, you're not, you're not blessing them. You're cursing them. You're slandering them. You're talking about them. You're gossiping about them. That tells you you're not at peace. You will know that you have made serious advancement in the peacemaking business when you are able to bless the very people who hurl insults at you. And you will also discover new levels of the reality and power of God to bring peace to seemingly impossible situations. I I, I, I close with this story. I've never forgotten. I read it years ago, and I'm actually reading the book again by an author called Rolf Garberg in his book, The Family Blessing, about the power of learning to bless your children. But that blessing goes beyond more than just your children. And he first learned this by watching his father, particularly as it related to Mr. and Mrs. Ahn, with whom they were neighbors for 13 years on a lake in Wisconsin. 20 years before the Garbergs moved in as next door neighbors, the Ahns had had a severe uh, falling out with someone at their church. So instead of taking steps of peacemaking, they became surly and mean spirited, not just towards the other members, but towards the entire membership of that church. How many of you know, have you ever noticed how whenever we really get ticked at someone, we have a hard time with anyone else who won't be ticked at them with us, right? Since I'm mad at them and you're not mad at them, I'm mad at you. The Ons just decided to live in hostility the rest of their lives towards all those hypocrites down there at the church. The author says they were in their mid-60s when we met them. When they first heard we were Christians, they wanted nothing to do with us. And he says, we did our best to honor their wishes except for the times when our dog, Schultz, a half collie, half German shepherd, would at times wander off our several acres and end up making free use of the Ons' yard. Well, needless to say, he said this infuriated Mrs. On. She would shout obscenities at him, even call the, she called the authorities one time. Garberg says, we honestly did our best to keep him away from them, but short of just tying him fast, even though, you know, we lived out in the country. He at times would run down to the, the, the lake shore and bark at the water skiers and things like that. And he says, one day the showdown came. Mrs. Owen was in her yard digging dandelions up with a picker, which had a five foot wooden handle on one end and a sharp. A uh, uh, twin pointed blade on the other, and when Schultz chased through her yard, she let fly with a lethal weapon. Fortunately, she wasn't much of a shot, but in the ensuing moment, she was up on our porch in a rage. I love how he writes, I'll never forget what happened next. Having observed the incident with the dandelion picker through our windows, we knew who was pounding on the door, and we all volunteered to let dad answer it. Garberg writes, there was Mrs. On literally bouncing up and down on the porch with rage like a plastic wind-up toy. For what seemed like forever, she assailed my dad at the top of her lungs. When she had nothing more to say, she just stood there sputtering like an old motor. Finally, she ran out of gas and stopped. Then dad looked at her and with a heart overflowing with compassion said, my dear Mrs. On, I am so sorry for how we have upset you. Will you please forgive us? And we will try never to let it happen again. God bless you, Mrs. On. Rolf was a little kid at this point. He says, she stood there absolutely defenseless, literally taken aback by the loving response she had just received. He says it's almost like she crawled off the stage and went humped over back to her house, you know, under the coals of fire. That's a Bible terminology about when you meet somebody else's anger with love. And it changed everything. Not instantly. That summer it looked like the Ons 
you know, we're barely home, and so their yard would grow up, and, and Dad would tell Rolf and, and his brother to get over and mow the, mow the yard. Well, we got to go mow her yard? Are you kidding me? And they would go mow it. And then a week later, go mow it again. And, it, and again, they didn't know whether she's home, but one day while they were mowing the lawn, she peeked out from behind the curtains. So they knew she was there. It was maybe the fourth or fifth time they went to mow the lawn that Mrs. Ahn came out of the house with a tray of lemonade. Said, here, thank you guys. Things were melting, see? Later that fall, Mr. Ahn suddenly became very ill. The Garbergs received a call from Mrs. Ahn asking if they could come quickly. Rolf writes, over the next few weeks, Dad and Mom visited the Ahns in their home several times. They would pray with him. They shared Christ with him. And finally, the day came when they both prayed to receive Christ as their Savior. He said, I can still remember the tears of joy in my parents' eyes when they told us what had happened. Just two weeks later, Mr. Ahn died and went to be with Jesus. But Mrs. Ahn joined our church and soaked up everything she could. The following summer, she was baptized in Lake Wissota, along with a number of others from that church. She remained a close friend of the family until she, too, died a few years later. And then he asked this poignant question. What would have happened to Mr. and Mrs. Ahn if my dad had blasted back a harsh response at her? Instead, God used the blessing of a true peacemaker to open the way for something supernatural, absolutely incredible to happen. And I ask the question today, what might happen if we lived that way as well? Could it be that God might write some more stories of his supernatural activity into some of our relationships? Oh, maybe they won't all end with the great ending that this story had. But I can tell you this. We paved the way for that kind of activity. When we say, Lord, by your power, make me a peacemaker. God looks down and says, that's my son. That's my daughter. Blessed are the peacemakers. They will be called children of God. Will you stand with me? I want you just to mark this moment now in the quiet of your heart. What has God spoken to you? First of all, would you just thank him that he's the God of peace? If you know him as your Savior, thank you, Lord, for the gospel of peace, that you've given me peace with God. If you've never received him, receive him into your life, you'll have peace with God. Maybe some of you need to say, Lord, I need a little bit more of the peace of God. I want to learn how to operate in security. I need healing. I need to know how much I'm loved by God so I'm not just thrown off by whatever anybody else thinks or says about me. I'm standing in the truth of what you say about me. Maybe some of you, hey, there's a peace conference to be had. I've been sitting here just waiting, 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 and I really need to sit down. I need to make a call. I need to write a letter. I need to do whatever I need to reach out and say, you know what? I love you, and I want us to be at peace. I don't know what he might say to you, but you respond to him. And bottom line, as you're here today, would you let him know, Lord, make me one of your peacemakers. Now with your hands extended, if you feel okay doing that, just open your hands. I wanna, I wanna pray this blessing over you because it is the heart of God for you and it's a prayer you can pray for yourself as well. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. 
And all God's people received this and said, Amen. Amen. Will you give him praise that he is your Jehovah Shalom? He is there to give you peace this week. Be one of his peacemakers, okay? God bless you guys. We'll see you back next week. If you need prayer for anything, come on down, and the prayer team will be here. Those of you watching online today, thank you so much for joining us. I pray God spoke to your heart. I pray that you become one of his peacemakers and that you'd lean into any place that you know there's conflict today and you've been avoiding it. Take a deep breath. Ask God to help you. It'll be worth it on the other side when you've quit quit faking it and you're, you're, you're moving into, hey, I, I want to make sure that I've done everything to make peace. God bless you. We'll see you back next week.